Everybody, welcome to the next edition of The Break. I am Brad Latchett. I'm the Director of Governments and Industry Affairs for PI Northeast. And I am joined, as always, by Claire Irvin, the uh, Government Affairs Council of PI Northeast. Today, Claire is going to be enlightening us on um, legalized cannabis and uh, what uh, employers uh, can do, I guess, with employees uh, in that realm. So, Claire, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. As Brad said, today's about how legalized cannabis affects um, any of you as employers or as employees in terms of your rights to uh, take advantage of the new law, take advantage or uh, restrict your employees from taking advantage of the new laws. So first, just as a quick rundown, recreational cannabis has been legalized for adult use with near immediate effect for adults 21 years of age or older. So 18-year-olds can still, uh, just like alcohol, they can't, they can't, can't purchase cannabis legally or use it legally, um, they can still vote and join the military. Um, the regular, all the details though, all the details for the actual sale of cannabis are still being developed. So it's kind of an interesting legal area where people can use it, but technically most of the ways they can uh, acquire it require uh, violations of the law driving to Massachusetts. Um, there's also limits on the amount of uh, cannabis that can be legally possessed. Um, that varies. It's pretty much an amount for personal use because, again, the details of selling cannabis are still being worked out. Um, employers are able to restrict cannabis usage outside the workplace in very limited specific circumstances. And so those circumstances are, um, so first of all, the restricting of cannabis in the workplace for just general employers. Um, you can't, you can't, you can restrict, prohibit employees from using cannabis on employer property and employer vehicles and other places controlled by an employer. So if you have an event at a facility that would potentially allow the usage, but you don't want to have it at your event, you can work that out. But if it's a workplace event, employers in charge. Um, employers may prohibit the use of the possession of cannabis in their workplace as well. So even that you can prohibit them from bringing it to the office, vehicles and everything. Um, employers are not actually required to do any of this though. So if you don't care, um, that is a choice. Um, it's good to review your personnel policies though to make sure that it's being, any of these restrictions are, up, um, all these restrictions comply with the laws of your state. And employers are not expected to enforce the law, uh, particularly on limits of possession. So an employer isn't expected to check if a 20 year old has um, cannabis or if someone has too much beyond the legal restrictions, you're not law enforcement. Um, all these limitations are simply based on employers trying to balance out their need to have a safe workplace with the fact that employees are now allowed to um, have possess these substances and use them outside the office. It is really important as employers to recommend to um, avoid accidentally discriminating against employees when it comes to this issue. So employers may not discriminate against any employee for their cannabis use outside the workplace on their own time, except in limited circumstances that we'll get to. Um, and employer, even when an employer suspects that their employee is impaired, uh, impaired by cannabis, they should be really careful when penalizing or terminating an employee. Um, one note, um, one note is that symptoms of cannabis impairment may actually be an undisclosed disability, in which case the employee would be very protected by the law. So it's approach it, approach it delicately, um, particularly because there's not really a clear list of uh, cannabis impairment um, symptoms. Um, New York has actually said that odor is insufficient on its own to approve impairment. Uh, cannabis impairment. So sim simply because someone smells like they've been in a car, uh, smells like they um, might be impaired does not mean that they are. Um, this is all made way more difficult by the fact that drug testing, unlike something like alcohol, where you can pretty much test in real time whether someone's impaired or not, that doesn't apply for cannabis, at least not at the moment. Um, someone can test positive for cannabis long after they've actually been impaired or used it. Um, so most employers are restricted from drug testing for cannabis usage. If your employment um, personnel policy allows for drug testing, it's really important to go and make sure that language is revised to reflect the fact that employees can use cannabis outside the workplace and can't be penalized or discriminated against for what, for that, um, for what they do on their own time. However, there is still situations, um, these come up a lot in questions about when drug testing is allowed. 
Um, and the short answer of it is that if it's specifically mandated by state and or federal law. So an example of this is for commercial truck drivers. Um, uh, federal, federal law as well as uh, state laws require commercial truck drivers or um, drivers of vehicles for hire, such as a um, like comer, uh, tour bus, a commercial tour bus um, are mandated to go through to be drug tested. Um, by law. So those, those employers may continue to drug test because they're required to by federal law. And because again, cannabis is being legalized on a state level, um, certain federal laws still override the state laws legalizing um, recreational cannabis usage. Um, however, there are some federal laws that allow or at least do not prohibit drug testing um, for just general employers. Those don't allow for general drug, drug testing. So it's the good rule of thumb is unless you can point to a to a statute that specifically says, hey, this employee needs to be drug tested, it's probably best to um, to avoid doing so for cannabis usage as well as just general, um, just in general. It's very important to consider that. So I've been teasing that there are still um, situations where employers may take actions for employee cannabis use, so whether in the workplace or even potentially outside the workplace. Um, does include when fed required by state or federal law. So in the situation where the state or federal law requires there to be drug testing, there would also be allowed penalties for testing positive for substances that impair their ability to do their job, including cannabis. Um, because federal laws still apply overall, um, still apply and uh, cannabis remains a schedule one drug under federal law. If an employer would be in violation of federal law, by not enforcing um, cannabis restrictions, then they may take actions against the employee for cannabis use. Again, that's spe specified in law. Um, it also extends when an employer would lose a federal contract or federal funding due to an employee's cannabis use. Um, so these are all specific, more narrow, and they're going to be narrow. They're in all likelihood going to be narrowly interpreted. Interpreted. Um, so just be cautious. Even if you think, oh, okay, like, there's a couple steps. It's really cautious. Be um, ask for, for further information. Be able to specify um, what laws apply. And then the more the two, both less defined and probably that apply to most employers, are that an employee manifests articulable symptoms of cannabis impairment during work hours, and they those symptoms either decrease or lessen their performance or they interfere with an employer's um, duty to their entire workplace to provide a healthy and safe workplace, then an employer may take actions for cannabis use. The problem with those two is that it's fair, again, there's no clear definition for articulable symptoms of cannabis impairment, and there's potential risk that they may be misinterpreting what they believe is a symptom of impairment or an undisclosed disability or some other issue. So proceed with caution when it comes to both of those points. Uh, one way to proceed with caution on those points is to not make an assumption about cannabis impairment and focus on the actions of the, just the actions of the employee without assuming or making a judgment of why the employee is acting this way. Um, employers are allowed to term terminate employees at will for performance, for performance issues, as well as have a duty to keep a workplace health, healthy and safe for all other employees. So focusing on the actions rather than the reason is a way to approach that cautiously. Again, doc, uh, it's very, it's a very tricky area. Don't rely solely on a, on a video on YouTube when trying to handle that, but just as legal words of advice. And so this is pretty much just a starting point. Um, pretty much with all of these issues, the advice is if you are trying to have any of the issues on this, talk to a lawyer, or call Brad or myself, um, proceed with caution proceed with caution. Um, this is a very tricky issue, particularly when the discrimination, uh, labor discrimination law comes into effect, which is what it, one of the laws updated to reflect the legalization of cannabis. Um, but that's pretty much the rundown for now. We'll provide more information as more information becomes available. So Brad, any questions? Thanks, Claire. That was awesome. Um, yeah, I do actually have a couple questions. Um, uh, first, I think, what can we expect with, I guess, cannabis and workers' comp? you know, how are those going to exist together? Yeah, though, that's still, that's one of the areas that's still really being worked out, um, partly because there haven't, there haven't been enough situations yet to really create um, effectively the workers' compensation version of case law. Um, but in all likelihood, it'll be treated like alcohol. So it'll be a contributory 
factor. Um, so if an employee is impaired on cannabis and can be proven to be impaired on cannabis, that will be in a consideration with workers' compensation benefits. Right. Um, the question now, you know, since we're still in a remote work world, um, I guess a couple of questions regarding that. Uh, what if uh, an employer, New York employer, has an employee who works out of state in a state that uh, cannabis is not legalized? Can that person, can the employer restrict usage then? Yep, yeah, employer, it, these protections only apply to the state, to the states that, um, to the state where um, the worker is based, the employee is based. So even a workplace, an employer that has multiple locations across the country, an office, an office in a location that hasn't legalized recreational cannabis use, they can restrict cannabis in a different ma manner than a New York branch could. So even beyond just the work, remote workplace, um, it's each office can have their own rules based on the local, state and local laws. Perfect. Um, now, a remote worker who is working in an employee, we talked, uh, I'm sorry, working in New York, you mentioned that employers could restrict um, usage and possession during work hours. That's obviously difficult with remote. They presumably can't limit somebody's possession of their own, like home, um, yep. but can limit during the work hours, presumably. Yep, it's, I mean, that would be a lot harder to enforce for the use during, use during work hours and they can't limit possession in the in that person's home. The limits on possession are based on venues that are um, pro pretty much buildings and other places such as vehicles that are controlled by an employer. Perfect. So if the employer rents a car and everyone's in it, the employer's pro employer can still ban someone from bringing cannabis with them, but at the same time, the employer can't prohibit someone from taking, leaving their cannabis in their own personal vehicle um, in the workplace parking lot. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you, Claire. Well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have anything else before we conclude? Um, nope, just we'll um, post additional resources below the videos, um, including a very good FAQ pro provided by the New York Department of Labor. Um, even if you're outside New York, that still provides really useful information that does apply, that is useful for employer, employers in New Jersey and Connecticut. Great. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us again for the break, um, and you'll be seeing us very soon. Bye, everybody.